Cairo, Seattle. And this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, Sona Mavsessian. Sona has been Conan O'Brien's assistant since 2009. She was featured countless times on his TV show and documentary. She's a co-host on his podcast, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. And she has a new book that just came out this week called The World's Worst Assistant. Your book is called The World's Worst Assistant. And I received it and I'm like, oh, ha ha, what a funny title. And then you start reading it and you're like, oh, no, she's being serious. Yeah, I, I know. I think people thought it was being a little hyperbolic, but I think there's so much truth to it. And of course, I assist a hugely successful, wildly popular person like Conan O'Brien. But as you can see, he also wrote the foreword, so he encourages this behavior. Like so many Californians, Sona has a special place in her heart for in and out So I invited George Moat to the show, the burger scholar who hosts TV shows and writes books about hamburgers, to tell us everything he knows about In-N-Out Burger. The history, its unorthodox way of doing business, why there are so few locations, everything. And George Moat will go to great lengths to have an In-N-Out Burger. Wait, hang on. I've, I've actually rented cars on a layover. I was I was in a layover from Japan once, rented a car and went over there and had a burger and went back to the <laughs> dropped the car off. You did at LAX? Oh, yeah. And we'll talk about why humans are evolutionarily disposed to be obsessed with sugar with neuroscientist Dr. Nicola Vina. But first, my conversation with Sona Mavsessian. In her new book, The World's Worst Assistant, Sona tells story after story about how she doesn't exactly put 100% into her job. I had never been anyone's personal assistant. It was all just very new to me. I wasn't sure how a lot of it was done, if I'm going to be honest. I think like a lot of people, I had this image in my mind of what television assistants and Hollywood assistants, what they go through. And so I was like, this could be awful or it could be really cool. And then when I started to realize that Conan had this really great sense of humor and he was very kind to people, he loved making the people around him laugh. I think I just became a lot more comfortable and allowing myself to come out more and more in my job until I got so comfortable (laughs) that I just... (laughs) neglected a lot of it. But someone asked me once, they're like, are you really the world's worst assistant? And I said, well, no, the worst assistant would probably last like a couple weeks. He mentions this in his forward. I somehow worked the system so that I'm doing this for 13 years and I am very, very mediocre to subpar. (laughs) And I get away with so much. I found a way to work the system to my benefit. And I'm, I, you know, I, I'm very proud of that. Here's a classic example of the Conan Sona relationship. Go ahead. I'd rather not say this. Please say it. I uh, once went to uh, a bar and drank too much and couldn't drive home. So I sent interns the next day. This was a long time ago to pick the car up. And I may have said that I needed them to pick your car. <laughs> I asked Sona to tell one of my favorite stories from the book. So, oh, that was one of my favorite weeks at work. Robert De Niro had this assistant who famously, she really did abuse the corporate card. I guess she embezzled money is a way to say it. But one of the things that they had mentioned in these articles that they wrote about how awful she was as an assistant was that she had binged, I think it was 55 hours of friends in a week you know, binging shows at work is my specialty. So one of the writers came up with this idea that I try to break her record. They were like, okay, so do you think you can watch more than 55 episodes of friends in a week? And I was like, watch me. I could have faked it. I could have been like working and then had it on in the background, but I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to do this right. And I'm just going to neglect everything and everyone and immerse myself into this challenge. And I did. I beat her record. I essentially spent every moment I wasn't in the restroom or eating. Of course, I have to socialize with my friends for part of the day. Every moment that I was not doing the essentials, I was watching television and it felt really good. See, that's me being a terrible assistant, but also providing, in my opinion, excellent content for the show. You know, it's a win-win for everybody. I get to watch friends at work and then 
you know, Conan gets to publicly make fun of me on television. Everyone's so, happy. And she didn't just watch Friends that week. And then on Friday, because I worked on the Warner Brothers lot, we went to every location that they shot Friends, me and my friend David, who works for Jeff Ross, our executive producer. So we went to, you know, where Central Perk was. We went to the fountain where they shot the opening. And so we spent an entire day doing that. So when you factor in all the episodes I watched, plus, plus on Friday, all the time we took going to all the different locations, I was in overtime. I made money <laughs> watching Friends at work. Did Friends you actually like, like file for overtime pay? Of course I did. Of course <laughs> I did. They're going to make me do it. Then I'm going to do it right. And I, if I'm going overtime to beat this record, then I should get paid for it. <laughs> it's my, it's my right. I'm sure there are people listening going, well, what happened to Conan that week? Like, what were you supposed to be doing for him that didn't get done? I, I mean, assisting him. I, I, at that point, I was his only assistant. Nobody was doing anything for Conan. Like I get a phone call that he had to go to rehearsal and I'd be like, Conan, you have to go to rehearsal, you know, but I couldn't leave my desk. I was chained to my desk. And so if he needed an errand to get done, I'd have an intern do it. But I neglected him so much that week. I remember that. But I think that he also loved that he got to talk openly on television about how terrible his assistant was. So again, you know, you provide a comedian with some, with some fun content. They forgive you for a lot of stuff. This is your current job. Let's go back doodly doodly and talk about your first job. Where was your first job, Sona? Burger King. Yes. How old were you? What was that like? What was the uniform back then? I was 16. It was my first summer job uh, when I got my license. And I had on these black orthopedic shoes, green and black striped shirt and a visor. And I mean, I was so sexy. That was a hot girl summer for me. But I, I really enjoyed that job. I mean, I had a, so much fun with it. I love Burger King. I, I mean, their chicken sandwich is one of my favorite things. You know, I ate a lot. I got free, you know, merch like that they would hand out in the, in the little kids meals and stuff. And I just, I had a really fun time. And I, I remember getting my first paycheck and being like, I earned this. How cool is this? I remember when they got me onto the drive through I was like, I made it. I did it. I'm at the drive through This is the most high pressure situation I'm ever going to be in, in my entire life. And I'm crushing it. I don't know where I read this, but in my notes, I just wrote loves Taco Bell. Are you a fast food person? I love Taco Bell. So when I first got my internship at NBC, I went to Taco Bell and I was like, I'm going to get some tacos. That was my celebration. I used to live next door to a Taco Bell. So I openly talk about this on our podcast, but you know, I'm, I partake in the wacky tobacco. And I used to just stroll over to the Taco Bell next door to my apartment. And I was like a regular there. And I mean, I can eat so many tacos in one sitting. I love it. Every once in a while, I'm just like, I just need some Taco Bell. You know, it just needs to happen. You know, when you're looking for an apartment or a house and they have that walking score, you know, and it's like 95%, they should have a walking score for Taco Bell. That'd be for you. It's like 95% walking uh, score would, to Taco Bell. I'm sold. I don't even need to look at the apartment. <laughs> I just need yeah. to Google Maps where the closest Taco Bell is. If you love Taco Bell as much as Sona does, make sure and go back into the archives and listen to our Rose McGowan episode. Her last meal is Taco Bell, and she has had the same exact order since she was a young teen. But don't listen right now. We're still in the middle of this episode. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Sona shares her fantastically long last meal, and we'll explore the history of In-N-Out Burger. Okay, so the big question, what would your last meal be? Ooh, okay, all right. So much of my love of food is rooted in my family. 
we're talking about like a whimsical situation where I could have anything I want. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so my grandpa passed last year and I used to go visit him and my grandma every Friday and they would make me, my grandpa would grill me lamb chops. He was a butcher since he was 12 and he would grill me up some lamb chops and he would pick some arugula from his yard and my grandma would make some French fries. So that was just because I was spending the day with my grandparents, that was my favorite meal was those lamb chops. So that would be a part of it. (laughs) Um, when I was pregnant, I could not eat enough fried chicken. I tried to stop myself just because it's so unhealthy. But every once in a while, I'd say to my husband, I was like, you have to go to Popeye's or wherever is open right now. And you have to get me some fried chicken, please. And he was just like, got it. I'll do it. I don't know if I've ever had bad fried chicken, to be honest with you. Love all fried chicken. If it's fried and it's chicken, I'll eat it. And I don't (laughs) care where it's from. I mean, I need an in and out burger in there. In and out's a huge part of my life as a born and bred Californian. I, I know this meal is out, out of control, but I'm sorry. I chocolate covered raisins, Kirkland signature, of course. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, of course, some some garbage food. I want some Taco Bell tacos. I need some McDonald's cheeseburgers, my chicken sandwich from Burger King, even though it's like redundant with the fried chicken. Uh, and that might be it. I love eggplant, maybe some just nice eggplant. And an eggplant. Would be lovely. (laughs) For her last meal, Sona wants her grandpa's grilled lamb chops with arugula from his garden. Her grandma's homemade french fries, fried chicken, an In-N-Out burger, Kirkland signature chocolate covered raisins, Taco Bell tacos, McDonald's cheeseburgers, a chicken sandwich from Burger King, and some nice eggplant. What is your in and out order? My in and out order is a cheeseburger with no tomatoes, animal style. And when did you establish your order and like learn about the animal style? Like, I feel like back in the day, it was like, oh my God, they have a secret menu. I mean, nobody, everybody knows that by now. Did you start so OG that it seems special and exciting? It's so funny you asked me that because I've never talked about this, but in sixth grade, I had a teacher who was an avid golfer. She loved golfing. And she was like, if I ever break a hundred, I'm buying everybody in here in and out. And at that point, my burger order, like a lot of kids, was just a plain hamburger, no cheese, just a patty and buns. That's it. She was like, I'm not going to get you guys special orders. Like you're going to have to just eat a regular cheeseburger. And I was like, I've never had a regular cheeseburger with stuff on it, you know? And she broke a hundred and she got the entire class in and out. And I remember eating that burger for the first time with the sauce, the lettuce. I took the tomatoes out because I've always hated tomatoes, but everything was in it. And I was transported to a new place. It was like it opened up my taste buds. I will never forget that moment, just being in that sixth grade classroom, eating that cheeseburger because I had no other choice and everybody else was eating it. And I was like, okay, fine. I guess I'll try stuff on my burger. Over time, of course, it evolved when I found out that animal style existed, which was not too long after that. And then that just became my order forever. See, this is why (laughs) teachers are the heroes of our society. You got taught about cheeseburgers. Yep. I'll never forget that day in Mrs. Hackett's class at Grazit Elementary. That was a big moment. Oh my God, I'm crying right now. What a beautiful story. (laughs) Teacher of the year. In and out Burger. Just hearing those words, I can imagine the white cup with the red palm trees, the employees in their little 1950s paper hats and red aprons. It's iconic. And maybe part of the reason In and out Burger is so special is that unlike many other burger chains, there aren't very many of them. As of July 2022, there are 378 In and Outs in seven states. McDonald's has more than 38,000 restaurants in 100 countries. And staying small is a big part of the company's philosophy. In and Out is a, is a great story because they have stuck to their guns literally since the very beginning. Nothing's ever changed. That's George Motes. You can call me the Burger Scholar. I host a show on First We Feast on Complex Media, and that's the title they gave me. So I stick with that title. George is writing his fifth burger book. 
He has a documentary on burgers called Hamburger America and all kinds of burger clout. They have actually managed to defy all of the stereotypes of franchising the burger business and the fast food business even in America by just sticking to their own philosophy, which is to keep it simple and don't change anything. Quality, uh, cleanliness are the two of the big words that show up all the time when you're, when you're reading and talking about in and out. And it's true. 1948, there was a couple named Harry and Esther Snyder started the company. They left it to their children, um, who then passed it on to more children. And it's still been in the same family and still the same damn thing for all these years. It's amazing. I will uh, beg to differ on one point. I read they did add hot chocolate to the menu in the last, I don't know, two decades. <laughs> That's about it for change. Uh, and you're right. The hot chocolate, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course I'm right. Let's talk about the menu. The menu is simple. You walk in and there's only five things on the menu. It's pretty incredible. Uh, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, French fries, milkshakes, and, and sodas. And that's it. Oh, and of course, you remember, as you said, there's also a hot chocolate now in the menu <laughs> for the last 30 years or whatever it is. First thing you see when you walk in and out is a smiling person. Everyone's smiling. I've also heard a rumor that they have, a, they have something called the Smiles Program, um, where <gasps> in and out executive walks into a, into a unit and they look for all the people who are smiling behind the counter and they give $100 to the person who has the best smile and says, keep smiling. <laughs> it's <laughs> almost a, a little rumor. psychotic. It's like friendly, but also a little bit nuts. Totally psychotic. <laughs> but they're also, they have better pay than anybody else in the fast food business. Um, so they're, they're happy to be there. But the yeah. beauty of this place also is that it, it is unquestionably a fresh product. They grind their own meat. They make their own patty. Nothing's ever frozen. It's all fresh. You know, you a, a fresh ground beef patty at a, at, a, at a very large chain. It's unheard of. It's becoming a thing in America. They bake their own buns at their own local commissary. The fresh lettuce, the fresh tomato, all that stuff adds up to a great burger. We can blame that freshness for the reason why In-N-Out opens in so few locations. They only open restaurants that are in close driving distance to one of their facilities, where the meat is ground and the buns are baked. Franchising became the model for the fast food business, uh, especially in hamburgers. This is something that In-N-Out did not do, and they bucked the trend when all the other businesses were franchising and selling the rights to their business to somebody else. In-N-Out refused to because they said that there's no question about it. The quality will go down. I guarantee if you went to a McDonald's in 1949, 1950, 1951, that was probably a really good burger. Sorry, McDonald's, but you know, there's no actual way to prevent uh, the quality from declining as you begin to franchise because there's, there's too many factors at play, which is exactly what Harry and Esther Snyder couldn't stand uh, with in and out was that they, they would hate to lose control of the basic quality of the product. So honestly, if you go to In-N-Out today, I'm pretty sure that that is the same exact burger you would have had, you know, back in the 19 in the late 40s. And I read that they're worth billions of dollars. So apparently their strategy worked just fine for them. What's your order? It's <laughs> a great question. So I never order off the menu. As we all know, there's a secret menu, which is actually not so secret because some of the basics of the secret menu are now on their website. If you look at the website, you can see they've also been trademarked. <laughs> so they own the rights to the names of these things like Double Double Animal Style or the Flying Dutchman, which are all things from the secret menu. So I'll get to that in a second. But my order personally, what I do is I order the Double Double Animal Style. That's my favorite. If I'm hungry, I add one patty. If you add a pa one patty to Double Double Animal Style, it's called a three by two. Two slices of cheese, three patties. Double Double Animal Style, um, plus the a Neapolitan shake, which is a shake that has all three flavors, strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla in the same cup. And I'd never get the fries. The fries are awful. But what I also do <laughs> is they have peppers that they usually have behind the counter or not behind the counter. California, almost bana yellow banana peppers. I bite off the tip <laughs> of a yellow pepper and I squeeze the juice into the burger to make it just a little bit spicy. I didn't know they had peppers. I had no idea. So is it like a peppercini in the pickliness and the spiciness? Exactly. It's a pickled pepper, and uh, but it's, it's much spicier. I get a three by two. So I get, or maybe it's a two by three. I get three slices of cheese and two patties because I like it to be completely enrobed in melted cheese. And it's so good. At In-N-Out, to me, the best burger is plain. I get nothing on it because I think that just having the super melty cheese and the meat and the bun, like it's so luscious and so umami that the vegetables distract from me. So that's what I get now. I've heard that before. I've heard that from people who would just say, oh, why do I want a salad on my burger? But I'll tell you something, though. There is something, I'm going to say, brilliant. Something brilliant about the combination of super crisp vegetables 
um, with these uh, very savory, hot ingredients. You've got literally the flavors and textures of everything you need. Sweet, salty, crunchy, cold, hot. It's all happening in your mouth at the same time. Then if you add the the pepper, you're singing, man. (laughs) So let's talk about the, quote, secret menu, unquote. The In-N-Out menu uh, is small. The In-N-Out secret menu is 10 times larger. But one of the most famous ones, of course, is the In-N-Out Double Double Animal Style. You take two patties, and both those patties are actually cooked in a little bit of mustard. They also add to this extra spread, not sauce. It's basically a Thousand Island dressing that's way better um, than any kind of Thousand Island dressing I've ever had. They put grilled onions on there. I think this adds pickles. There's no pickles on a regular Double Double. And, of course, there's still the lettuce, the tomato, and, of course, the cheese. All of the employees are trained to know the entire secret menu, and they never blink. You can go to animal style fries, which is basically, it's a load of fries. On top of that is the spread and uh, some onions. And I think if you do animal style cheese fries, you get cheese, onions, and the spread on the fries. Yeah, that's the nice thing about going in and out is because they have the psychotic friendliness and the smiles combined with the secret menu that they don't get annoyed if you order anything you want. You know, you can pull a When Harry Met Sally diner scene and say, I don't want this, add this, and not feel embarrassed because they don't care. They don't care. They really don't. And also, I don't know how they do this. That You walk out of there with, a, with your bill is like $8, and you, but you're stuffed. How'd that happen? Because they own all their own property, I guess. Because yeah. They own own property. It's exactly so right. cheap. What's your beef? No play on words intended with the fries at in and out Let's just begin by saying that people know this about me, that I'm not a big fan of the French fry. Uh, in fries general. Are, in general, just because usually it's a letdown. We can all admit that we've had bad fries before. Yeah. I mean, that's just what happens. Fries are usually a distraction. I'd rather have a potato chip, honestly. They're, they cook, they're cooked better. <laughs> if you don't cook them the right way, you get them. They're oily. They're cold. It's like, what am I doing? Yeah. So to, for me, honestly, I'd rather have a second burger than have a lot of fries. Me too. Yeah. I've actually got me onion too. ring, and I've decided in the last year that the chances of getting a bad onion ring are far lower than getting a bad French fry. So I feel like yeah, almost nine out of 10 times, the onion rings are good. Whereas the French fries, there's so many styles and varieties that everyone kind of has their right. favorite. With onion rings, there's two. It's like it's either beer battered or panko. People don't realize also that making French fries, is, it's very difficult to do. Because you have to cut the fries a certain way. You then have to cook them based on their thickness. You basically cook it twice to make it crispy. And In-N-Out never does that the right way. The In-N-Out fries are pretty bad uh, because they, they just don't follow any of the traditional rules of, of frying a potato. And that's a problem. In-N-Out gives off a very squeaky clean image. The tidily dressed, friendly staff, the 1950s Leave it to Beaver vibes, the Bible verses printed on the bottom of the cups. But the family business is not without some scuffs and scandal. in and out doesn't give very many interviews. My request was very politely declined. But Forbes got an exclusive interview with the current owner in 2018, and it was quite candid. Lindsay Snyder became CEO of in and out in 2010 at 27 years old after her uncle was killed in a tragic plane crash and her father, a race car driver, died of a drug overdose. The story is wild. Um, when they found him dead in his... 68 Dodge Charger, which, of course, is a hot car to begin with. Um, 3.30 in the morning on Christmas Day, his face was buried in a briefcase containing a small pharmacy of drugs, including marijuana, Valium, Clonopin, Codeine. In addition, uh, he was carrying a 9mm Glock, an 8-inch switchblade, and $27,000 in cash. Forbes says Lindsay, quote, never graduated from college and lost her father to drug abuse. As a young woman, she battled through a period of alcohol and drug use and three divorces. Snyder, a devout Christian who sports tattoos of Bible verses, came out of those experiences drawn to in and outs longstanding stability, determined to change the company as little as possible, particularly the brand's image of 1950s wholesomeness. Lindsay made Forbes 400 list that year. She was the youngest woman on the list with a net worth of $3 billion. All right, who wants a burger? I want a burger. Why isn't there an in and out burger near me? After the break, we will be back to make you crave more tasty things. Sona confesses to a chocolate addiction and will be joined by a neuroscientist who explains what happens in the brain when we try and give up sugar. We're back with Sona Mofsessian. 
So let's talk about your relationship to chocolate, your daily relationship with chocolate. Oh, chocolate's so important to me. All chocolate. I've gotten to the point where if I don't have a piece of chocolate every day, I'll get a headache and I'll feel it. And it'll, <laughs> it'll be my body being like, it's chocolate time. You need it. <laughs> and when I was pregnant, it's all I wanted. When I was not pregnant, it's all I wanted. You know, my husband knows when he goes to the grocery store, if he does the grocery shopping, he needs to get chocolate. It's a must. It's like somebody needing coffee in the morning. Like I've had such a long, very special relationship with chocolate and I, I love it. And I, I'm not a dieter, Rachel. I don't know if that came through in my book. I'm not someone who diets. I'm not someone who really watches what she eats. I love eating and I love food. And so there will never be a time where I will deprive myself of a piece of chocolate, whether it's dark milk, white, I don't care. I love it. I what love is it. your favorite chocolate or the one that you eat the most? The one that I eat the most. Um, okay. <laughs> this is going to sound a little strange. I have a very special connection with Kirkland signature chocolate covered raisins from Costco. Uh, they come in a giant tub. And my mom used to get it when we were kids. And there was probably, I want to say over 15 years where I just never ate it because I didn't have a Costco membership. And then my husband and I got a Costco membership and I saw the tub of chocolate covered raisins. And I was like, okay, let's see if it's as good as I remember it. And oh my God, I don't know if it's just, it's because it's tied to my childhood. I don't know if there's just really special memories attached to it. But Kirkland Signature chocolate covered raisins, I can eat the whole tub. Like I'll open the pantry to get a couple and I'll just stand there for minutes, 10 minutes, just like eating it, standing there and then just being like, okay, I'm just gonna get a few more eating it, just standing there. And that that's just like my day, with my, <laughs> my raisins. I know who are these people who, who have control and they, they say, well, you just put it in a little bowl and you bring the bowl to the couch <laughs> and then that's it. And I'm like, yeah, but then I go back and I refill the little bowl like 17 different times. Oh my God. Exactly. So I was like, why am I even why yeah. am I kidding myself? Let me just take it directly from the giant tub, eat it, stand there, like wait, until my body's like, okay, let's put a few more in there, you know? And then, and then that's just the way it is. I wish I could tell you some exotic, you know, Swiss brand of chocolate that I love, but it's, it's Kirkland chocolate covered raisins. I just have to tell you quickly that my favorite chocolate was just discontinued. And I've never had that happen before. Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's, they did just like two weeks ago. It's a milk chocolate with, um, See, I've already forgotten because I had to like remove it from my life. It's the no. hazelnut chocolate. It says on the bag, it's like 30% hazelnuts. And it's true. It's like every bite. It's just like big, chunky, whole hazelnuts enrobed in chocolate in this bar. And it's Swiss chocolate. And it's gone. It was just gone one day. They didn't even warn you. They, didn't they call weren't me. like, hey, guys. They didn't fax no. me. Nothing. And they said that they That's took it away. Cool. And it was interesting because I was talking to the Trader Joe's guy for a minute and he was like, Trader Joe's tries to keep their prices low. So he said if a supplier, if it gets too expensive, they just stop selling it. But Trader Joe's, I would pay oh. those prices. Bring her back. Yeah. yeah. This is your way to this let is, them know. Yeah, that's why I'm, you're not even here right now, Sona. I'm talking straight to Trader Joe's. <laughs> shh, Sona, shh. I support <laughs> this. Sona says if she doesn't eat chocolate every day, she gets a headache. I wanted to learn the science behind this phenomenon. So I called up Dr. Nicole Avina, associate professor of neuroscience at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. What is happening like if somebody gets a headache because they don't eat sweets? Well, there's lots of research that's been going on around this very question because so many people have this happen to them. Sometimes they get a headache. Sometimes they feel lethargic. Sometimes they can even feel a little irritable. And so we've actually done a lot of research in my lab about this. And what we've found and others have found as well is because sugar can affect your brain in a way that's very much like what happens when people become addicted to drugs. And so those negative feelings are actually the withdrawal component. One of the big things that happens is that the way in which our neurotransmitters work gets changed completely. Normally, we release dopamine when things feel good, but 
when someone's addicted to drugs of abuse, they're releasing dopamine in overtime in response to drugs and alcohol. And what ends up happening with sugar is that it can do the same thing. It can cause our dopamine release to spike just in response to tasting a small amount of sugar. And that's why when if you go for a period of time without it, your dopamine levels plummet. And so you have that lethargic or irritable or cranky or sometimes even experience some physical manifestations like headaches in response to not having sugar for a certain amount of time. Dr. Avina says it's not just processed sugar. Any kind of sweetness can have the same effect. Do we know biologically why we react to sugar in this way? Why is sugar addictive in the first place? Well, we're actually born to be addicted to sugar, believe it or not. And this is because we have this evolutionary drive to like things that taste sweet. We code them as being safe. Back when we were hunters and gatherers, we used to have to walk around the forest and hunt an animal for a long time or hopefully stumble upon a berry bush. And what we learned from years and years and years of doing that was that when we got food that tasted sweet, so if you found a berry bush and you picked a bunch of berries, the sweet ones would be good for you and healthy. But the sour ones, the ones that had fallen to the floor or rotten, wouldn't be good for you. Same happens when we give birth. So babies, the first thing that they consume typically is breast milk or in our modern day baby formula. And those things taste sweet. And so our initial tastes our first foods are sweetness. And we have this biological drive to assume that they're safe. And what's happened in our modern environment is that that's kind of gone awry because we have sweeteners added to pretty much everything that we eat. And so we have so much sugar and added sweeteners in our diet that it's no longer necessarily coded as being safe. We're finding that there's sugars added to things that are really just not healthy for us. And if anything, unsafe for us to consume in abundance. You would hope with, you know, evolution and just our animal selves that we would be addicted to vegetables because it's the best thing for us. But I guess like you're saying, you know, if we just still lived primitive lives, we would eat a normal amount of sugar. We wouldn't overdo it. We wouldn't have the opportunity to overdo it. So this was just something that happened because of the industrial revolution, I guess. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting when we think about evolution, it's really hard for most of us to think about how long that actually takes. If we look back for thousands of years, I mean, humans have kind of looked the same for a really long time, but we've made so many advances in our society and the way that we eat. And essentially, we haven't been able to evolve our brains to keep up with those things expecting our brains to just suddenly not want to eat sweet all the time because we know it's bad for us now based off of the research isn't quite so easy because we still have this innate drive based on our biology to just want to eat it and to be drawn toward it. Do you think, I mean, I don't know, you're not like an evolutionary psychic, but do you think, you know, over thousands or millions of years, that could be what would happen since it doesn't seem to be good for us, the kind of sugar and the amount we're eating? Oh, absolutely. I think if we could fast forward to the future, I think we will probably see that at some point humans will not want to eat things that are sweet because at some point in the evolution of human beings, we're going to see that it's actually going to be harming us more so than being helpful to us. And so I think it is something that unless our nutrition changes and unless the way in which we approach our food supply changes, we're probably going to see a radical shift in the way we approach sweetness from an evolutionary standpoint, for sure. Let's get back to Sona and her relationship with her boss, Conan O'Brien. Does Conan have any food quirks or things that you know about him that you're like, oh, don't put this on that, or he really likes this? He has a very interesting relationship with food. He loves food, but of course, he's also on camera talent. So anytime he looks at himself in the monitor and he doesn't like that he's gained weight or something, then he goes on lockdown. I mean, he really controls what he eats. He's very good about exercising and in eating properly. And I know that when he's locked down, it's turkey wraps with a lot of turkey, red onions, mustard. It's like on a gluten-free tortilla. I mean, it is just tasteless cardboard almost. 
it's not that he punishes himself. It's that it's the pressure of being on camera. I don't see him gaining. I, I think he's always been just a svelte, tall person, but I don't see him the same way he sees himself. If I was somebody who was on camera all the time, maybe I would be different with food, but pro- probably not. I just probably don't have not. that same discipline. discipline. And with the way you guys torture each other, I can see him eating his gross cardboard little wrap and you're eating like a seven layer wedding cake right across from him. A hundred percent. Over and over again, I've done that. Be like, <laughs> oh, wow, that looks real delicious as I'm ch- just biting into a juicy burger right in front of him. And that was Sona Mobsessian's last meal. The World's Worst Assistant is out now. Buy it and support Sona and your favorite local independent bookseller. I will say it is an excellent summer hammock read. I read it in a hammock when I had COVID. Thanks to George Motes. Just finished writing my fifth book. It's an update of my cookbook called uh, The Great American Burger Book. We added 22 recipes to the book, which already has 40 in it. So you've been eating a lot of burgers. (laughs) When you make a recipe... You don't just do it once. No. Did you have testers? I've tested some for some friends books and I freaking love it. It's the most fun thing ever. All my neighbors, my neighbors are like, I smell burgers. Uh You make it, you look on the cookbook and then she'll share and I'll pass. I pass burgers over my backyard fence. I give them to my neighbor upstairs. You know, it's funny. You need to invent some kind of device that you can like shoot a burger, like a t-shirt gun into somebody's (laughs) mouth or yard or something. I like that. It's a good idea. Let's work together on that. Yeah. Thanks to Dr. Nicole Levina, Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. This episode was produced by me and Laura Scott. Original music by Prom Queen. And if you like the show, please rate and review if you are listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I swear it really does help get the show out to more people. And it is a nice free way to support the show and keep us open for business. Follow along on Instagram. Hello, Rachel Bell. P.S. I'm going to have a special way for you to participate in an upcoming episode. So keep an eye on my Instagram stories. If you have a comment or a question or a guest to suggest or a taco that I should eat, please email me. Go to yourlastmealpodcast.com. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Hi, George. Your hair looks magnificent in that drawing. Hey, I'm in my mom's basement right now. <laughs> no, I love when you said that, because that's like the thing I always joke about is just like some dude making a podcast in his mom's basement and you're literally doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a podcast in mom's basement. <laughs> you're going to have her throw some Pop-Tarts down the stairs in a couple hours. Exactly. Yeah. Mom, where are my Pop-Tarts? Mom, turn your stories down. I'm trying to play Magic the Gathering. <laughs> A lot of people who do podcasts like to take screenshots. Please don't take a screenshot. (laughs) I won't. I'm going to leave mine off too. I'm like at the last stages of getting over COVID. So I read your book in like a COVID fog. So if I say something and you're like, that's not in my book, it's not my fault. It's COVID's fault. I won't even know. It's I won't even notice because I, I've read so many versions of that book in, in the sense of like editing and re-editing. And I forgot what's in it. I forgot what my book even is. But let's <laughs> talk about it. So we went on a tour in 2010, the legally prohibited from being funny on television tour. It's after Conan left NBC and American Express was sponsoring it. So they got us a private plane so we could travel everywhere much more quickly. It was the first time I was in a class higher than economy. So it was just this shock. And then after two months of flying, the plane was going to take Conan somewhere else and we were all going to come back to L.A., So they put me on a commercial flight and they put me in first class as like sort of just a gift. And I remember sitting in first class and being like, this is disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) The way that I changed in two months from someone who was like, oh yeah, I'll sit next to the bathroom. Like, that's fine. To like, I cannot believe I have to fly first class instead of in a private plane. Like this is horrendous. The speed at which that changed for me was shocking. So it was the first time I had to remind myself, like, you're not paying for this. Conan's not even paying for this. This is a massive billion dollar company that's paying for this perk. This is work. That's how I travel for work. And it's really, really nice. And then when I go home and I have to travel for fun, it's a lot more budget friendly constant reminder. You didn't earn this. Conan did. You're riding on his coattails. Don't ever forget that. But 
I try to milk it as much as possible. Anytime I travel with him. 